Something we've never spoken about before is wedding photography, and yet it is such a kind of staple thing that so many photographers at least try out. So let's talk about it. It's Tutorial Tuesday. <laughs> Welcome back to Tutorial Tuesday, where each and every, each and every Tuesday we bring you a brand new, fresh photography tutorial. This week, like I said in the intro, we're talking about wedding photography. Now, this is it's such a big thing to so many photographers. A lot of us at least dabble in it once, just to see what it's like. It can be kind of a staple way to make a bit of money from your photography, and it's something that, you know, is reasonably accessible to anyone with a camera and a lens, but there are so many things to think about. It's actually such a big deal. I've certainly shot a few weddings and it certainly is a particularly stressful thing to go and do, but there are lots of ways to limit the stress, to really prepare, to be completely ready to take it on. So let's go through a few tips. Now we're going to cover kind of as much as possible in a shorter time frame as possible because honestly we could speak for hours about this and there's so much to talk about. So we're really going to do sort of high level stuff, you know, not going in too deep but covering as much as possible for anyone who wants to maybe try wedding photography and all the different things that you might want to think about. But of course if you have any of your own tips, absolutely pop them down in the comments as well. So let's get into it. First up, let's talk about getting started and all the things you need to do before you even go and book a wedding. Now that includes things like really getting to know your camera. So that means really knowing the settings, how to change them quickly, things like obviously you've got aperture, shutter speed, ISO, knowing where all the different dials are and how they work, but including things like the custom button. So setting them up for things like auto ISO, white balance, exposure compensation, lots of different things that you might want to set up on the fly, turning eye autofocus on and off, changing the type of autofocus. Now alongside this we should also talk about shooting in RAW, that's going to give you the most room afterwards to actually change things like exposure, colour, stuff like that. It's going to give you the most raw information which you can then edit when you come to edit your photos. This is great and it saved me a couple of times. If you do make a slight mistake, if you overexpose, if you underexpose, you've got so much more room to pull that back to where it should be no one's even going to know. Another thing that's really going to help is if your camera supports dual SD cards, setting up some kind of backup option. So you're either shooting to both cards or you're shooting to one and it's backing up to the second one. That means that if one of your cards fails or corrupts or anything like that, you are then shooting onto the second one as well. You've got that data backed up. There is nothing worse than an SD card corrupting and that is especially true if you've just shot a wedding and everything's gone. So having the dual cards, having them backing up, that is so, so useful. Hopefully you'll never need it, but on that one time you do, it is really, really going to be a lifesaver. So with all that said, let's talk about equipment. Now, generally speaking, in an ideal world, you want to take two cameras. Now, whether that means you own two or you own one and maybe you rent another one, I like to take two of the same camera and set them up in exactly the same way so I know where every control, every button is. And the reason I do that is I can have two lenses, one zoom lens, for example, on one camera and then a prime lens on the other. So typically a 24 to 70 f 2.8 on one camera and then an 85 mil or a 50 mil nice fast aperture, maybe f 1.4 on the other camera. So I've got a nice fast prime and a good zoom as well, ready to go at all times. The other main reason, other than having two lenses so you can switch them super fast, is if something happens to one of those cameras, you have an instant backup. You know, if you drop it, which isn't outside the realm of possibility, or if it just stops working or something happens to it, someone spills a drink on it, as terrible as that is, that is a problem you can fix later on, but you have another camera to go right now. Because of course it goes without saying, weddings, it really is, part of the reason it's so stressful is it's a one-time opportunity. You get the shots or you don't, there's no do-overs. So having that backup camera, is super useful. And of course using them both is really handy as well. Now I like to have actual grips on the side of my kind of belt so I can have a camera kind of on each side. I feel a little bit like a cowboy with two guns, but it's cameras. But it actually really helps. It means I can very quickly unclip one, take whatever photos I need. Oh, I want to use a prime for that. Clip, unclip, prime. It just makes the whole thing a lot easier 
and ultimately it lets me get more and better shots as well. Now of course one camera is obviously fine, a lot of us start off with just one camera for weddings, and like I say, if you want to own all of your equipment, one camera might be the way to go. In that case I would limit the number of lenses you're going to take, so a good zoom at 2470 is always great, a 70 to 200 can be great as well, if you want to use something like that instead of an 85mm, and then maybe have a 50mm prime, nice fast aperture, that's going to work really well. But I would say that generally you want at least to have one good zoom, kind of all rounder, maybe 24 to 70, and then one good fast aperture prime, maybe a 50 mil as an all rounder if you're just gonna have the one. Ultimately, you need to think about how you're gonna get all this kit to the wedding and how you're gonna have it at the wedding. Is it gonna be in a rucksack, a backpack that you just have on you all the time? Are you gonna take a Peli case and leave that somewhere? You need to make sure it's safe, it probably will be, but it's something to keep in mind. Where is it gonna be? Where are you gonna keep all of your stuff? It needs to be out of sight of kind of all the guests, ideally. You don't wanna ruin the day, but you wanna have it accessible. So. I don't like to take too much with me because I want to know it's kind of on me and I can just get whatever I need whenever I need it. Now that leads us on to the next thing which is so, so important and that is communication. Now this is such a big deal that some photographers overlook a little bit when they go into wedding photography and that's because it feels like wedding photography is all about the photography whereas realistically, it is absolutely about the service that you're providing to the couple. This is really a service that you're providing and the photos kind of no one cares how you get them, how you get to that kind of amazing photographic state. It's all about the service you provide. And a big part of that is the communication up front, during, and then after as well. So it's a great idea to have a good meeting with the couple to discuss what kind of shots you're gonna deliver, how much you're gonna deliver, when, all that kind of stuff. You can get an idea of things like who you want in the portrait, so you get family portraits set up, you can get a time frame of the day, a bit of an idea of where you're gonna be with who and when different things are actually happening. So something to keep in mind with wedding photography is a great way to approach it is like telling a story of the day. You wanna get photos of getting ready, but that involves maybe the groom and the bride separately. You wanna get photos of the venue, before for, during, after, you want to make sure you're there for the vows, for all the stuff, the actual ceremony itself, but then afterwards at the party, you want to make sure you're getting candid shots, you want to set up the family portraits, now you need to know who's going to be in the family portraits, and you really want to establish all of this stuff beforehand so that it makes your life a lot easier on the day. If you establish a list, for example, of the family portraits that you're going to need to take, it's going to make it a lot easier when you get to the day and people start swooping in, deciding that they want to change things or they want to have this family portrait done or it's completely different or hey can we have some done or you know a bunch of other guests want a big portrait no because you've established a nice list you can tick them off as you go and you can get through them because number one the couple don't want the family portraits to take all the time up and number two you have loads of other shots that you are going to want to be doing as well so it's not just about those portraits but establishing an order and a list ahead of time is really gonna help you out. That same thing goes for the time frame of the day. When are things happening? The vows, the cutting of the cake, the first dance, all that stuff is really important because if you've established kind of a, a time frame, a time scale through the day, you can work out where you need to be and when. You know, where is the groom getting ready? Where is the bride getting ready? Can you go to both places beforehand to get shots? then meet them at the venue, you know, do you need to be there for the car, all that kind of stuff. So a great bit of communication up front is really important. It can also be great to then touch base again just before the wedding, just in case anything's changed, just in case there's new plans. You know, you're not gonna be their top priority in informing different things. So it can be a great idea to just touch base again. It also just makes them feel like they can trust you, they're confident in what you're doing, you seem like you're on top of things. And that is a really important thing to convey as well. In an absolutely ideal world, you don't want the couple to ever really think about the photographer because if they're not thinking about the photographer that means they have complete trust in what you're doing. Lastly, you're gonna to wanna to work out a shot list for yourself so that you can tick those off through the day. Obviously, you're gonna to have to adapt, you're gonna to have to go with different things as it goes, but if you have a shot list, you at least know what you're aiming for. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the settings that you're gonna use, because that can be a really interesting one, and the less you have to think about things like this, the better, I think. So, I like to shoot in manual, but I like to use auto ISO. That means that I'm in complete control of things like motion blur with shutter speed, the actual aperture, so the depth of field, but the camera is making sure things are nice and exposed correctly by using the ISO. Now that means I can just adjust things like the exposure compensation to actually adjust if I want it a little bit darker or a little bit brighter, but otherwise 
I'm pretty much in control without having to worry completely about exposing correctly with things like ISO. Now, a lot of the time it'll feel like shooting wide open with a nice fast aperture is gonna look the best because you get a nice shallow depth of field. But sometimes you do wanna stop down. Now there are specific situations where I will always stop down. A nice group shot, a family portrait, I will generally stop down to at least f4, maybe f5.6, just to make sure if anyone is standing slightly in front or behind anyone else, you are getting everyone in focus. You do not want to have a situation where the bride and groom are in focus, but the rest of the family members are slightly, slightly soft. It might be that no one notices, but you'll always know. And believe me, I've done it. And I know, and it will never stop haunting me for the rest of my life. So learn from my horrible mistake. Stop down a little bit for those bigger portraits, for those group shots. Make sure you have a slightly deeper depth of field and get everyone nice and in focus. You want to be a little bit careful with autofocus, not to rely on it too heavily. But for the most part, I think it is such a useful tool, and especially for situations like this, where things can move really fast. And it's just so good these days. You know, I shoot a lot of Sony, I shoot a lot of Canon, things like that. They just have such, such good autofocus. It's so, it's so useful for situations like this. Okay, so composition. Now this is obviously a big one. There's a lot to think about here, and there's a lot of different types of shots that you're gonna be getting. The first thing to think about is always gonna be the light. Where are the light points? Where is the light coming from? Big windows, anything that's gonna be nice diffused light, nice soft light, it's gonna be great. You can't necessarily move the light, but you can move yourself to get into better positions. Work out where the light's coming from and make sure to get those nice shots. Don't be afraid as well in a situation like this to ask people to move slightly. You know, if you wanna just just shepherd people to a specific area where the light is better. There are subtle ways of just doing that to get that better shot. And don't be afraid to do that because at the end of the day, they won't remember that you did that, but they will remember the better shot that you got because of that. Another huge tip here is to make sure to think about your background and your foreground. Things can get a little bit messy at weddings, both literally and also, you know, people have a few a few drinks. So you get things like bottles kind of strewn around, things get a little bit untidy. Don't be afraid to move things to just tidy up a little bit because you wanna think about that foreground and that background. What's behind the people that you're shooting? Is it gonna be in the frame? Is it gonna be in the photo? And is it gonna be distracting? You know, just taking an extra 30 seconds to either move people or ask someone, can we just move these bits or can you just come over here? Is gonna get a better photo that is gonna be much, much more appreciated than just taking a photo of someone as much rubbish behind them or you know uncleared plates or something like that so you want to think about that background that foreground it's really important there's a lot going on a lot moving very fast so something to just always be aware of and something I find really really handy when I'm shooting candid shots especially at the venue of the party and stuff like that I'll often shoot just a little bit wider than I might otherwise so especially in a zoom I'll just I'll just zoom out a touch more than I otherwise would and the reason for that is I'm focusing at that point on finding moments that are happening, you know, interactions between people, nice moments to capture. And a big part of that is just timing, making sure I nail that shot. And if I get that composition slightly wrong, it doesn't matter so much if I'm slightly wider because I can crop that down and recompose in post. I've always found that really, really helpful. Obviously, if you can get it right in camera, perfect. But if you don't quite get it right, you've always got that little bit of room to crop and just shooting a little bit wider really helps with just navigating that potentially sticky situation. Right, that's five tips, but I'm gonna do a bonus one as well. And that's all about confidence. It really is so important with wedding photography because it's a one chance situation. So you cannot redo these photos. You get the one opportunity to go and shoot them. So it is so important to make sure you get the shots. That means you need to be in control of your day. now. You're gonna get lots of people coming up to you telling you how they think you should take photos, what photos you, they think you should take. That's why it's so important to have that list discussed with the couple before the wedding day. That way you've got an idea of what they want and ultimately they are the clients. Don't let other people kind of tell you how to control your day. You know what you're doing, you know where you need to be, you know the shots you need to get. So make sure you have the confidence to control your day. That goes into every aspect we've talked about. Asking people to move into a better place for a photo, moving things around to get a better shot, and even moving yourself into situations where you think you might be intruding a little bit. Obviously, if you move right up into the couple's faces, as they're about to do, you may now kiss the bride. That's not ideal, but if you move around behind and you know, you're being respectful, but you are making sure to get a good shot, 
that is going to be appreciated later when they see the photos. Photography weddings can be stressful. There are lots of unknown situations. There's often a bit of drama that you weren't necessarily expecting and there's lots of things to deal with. But if you are confident, you've planned things out and you know how your camera works and what you're doing, you are gonna have a much better time and ultimately you're gonna give a much better impression and end result to your client, which hopefully results in further weddings if that's something you then want to do as long as the first time wasn't super horrible. So I hope that's helpful. If you have any tips of your own, absolutely I'd love to hear them down in the comments because I feel like I've tried to speed through as much as I could there as kind of primary advice for going to shoot a wedding, to go and to take those photos from setting up, from getting started, from communication all the way through to kind of delivering that end result. There's a lot there where he'd go deeper in. I mean, every point there really could probably be his own video. We could do a whole series on wedding photography. So if you wanna know more, let me know down in the comments because I'd love to make more videos that you wanna see. And of course, share your own tips down there as well because it's always super useful. And I've gotta say, you guys have got some amazing tips for a lot of this stuff. You guys are really, you know, it's an interesting community, a really, really interesting, and uh, if I may say, an awesome community that we've built here and I really, really like it. Of course, there's a full list of a bunch of kit that we use for photos this video, everything down in the description so you can go check that out for yourself. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video because there'll be new content all the time. I'll see you in the next video, but until then, as always, thanks for watching.